Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are the Blue Finder Capstone Group and this is our end of the year presentation. So introducing our development team, my name is Stefan and I worked on PCB design as well as software help and I was the team lead. Hey, uh, I'm Rob, I did PCB design and software help. I'm Rennie, I worked on software design and digital signal processing. Hi, I'm Arthur and I also worked on software design and digital signal processing. I'm Cynthia, and I also worked on the software design and the Fusion slash UI. So what is BlueFinder? BlueFinder is a prototype hardware software platform that enables limited range direction tracking of Bluetooth devices without any additional information. So what that means is uh, the device doesn't need to, the device being tracked doesn't need to be sending any more additional information, just using the signals we, uh, we can track it. So to review our project, it's important to note that we have built off of last year's Blue Dentist project. Their project captured Bluetooth packet information, so we use that as a base to add our more complex systems. Our project BlueFinder locates Bluetooth devices by using software-defined radios, specifically XCRXs that are programmed with direction-finding algorithms. So there already exists a one-way direction-finding feature in Bluetooth. However, this feature requires the modification of packets and both devices permission. The benefit of our project is that we can track multiple devices without modifying the packets and no help from the transmitters. Because of this, we can non-invasively track and analyze ad hoc gatherings of customers in room scale environments, and we can track, tally, and manage workers or assets in a workplace. So um, we're gonna talk about the hardware now. Here's a block diagram overview of, uh, of the hardware. Um, we break it down into three parts. We have the red part, which is the power. We have the uh, blue part, which is the computation, um, uh, the SOM and the uh, microcontroller. And then we have the green part, which is the peripherals, which is our uh, software-defined radios and the SSD that we use to store the information. So um, the STM32 controls power, uh, and then the SDRs send in the uh, raw information to the uh, Jetson to, uh, to compute. So um, we're gonna go over some of the, the main pieces of hardware. This is the Jetson. It's basically, uh, it's a big GPU with uh, a little cell phone CPU in it. Uh, and it's what we uh, wrote the software for. So um, uh, yeah, the data comes in from the radios. Uh, it does the processing. Um, while the software team developed the, um, the software and the hardware was working on the hardware, we used the dev board version to, uh, to actually write the software. And then this is the, uh, the SDR. So uh, if you don't know, uh, so SDR is a software defined radio. It means uh, you can change it by uh, doing code instead of by actually having to uh, change hardware. Um, so for this, we, um, we set it so that it uh, listened in on a 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency, which is what Bluetooth uses, also what Wi-Fi, old Wi-Fi uses. Um, we designed the hardware to uh, accommodate two because each one of these can take um, uh, two uh, receiving antenna. Uh, the idea being for our algorithm, the more antenna we have, the, um, the better the performance. But um, we ran into some issues where uh, only one was able to be used, but the hardware can accommodate two. So our next piece of key hardware is our antenna rig, our antenna assembly that we created. Uh, essentially what it does is we wanted to have our antenna uh, away from the rest of our board uh, so that we could lack, uh, avoid interference. And so we designed this uh, 3D printed uh, little antenna holder, which mounts the antenna. Um, and we had uh, some connectors that ran wires much farther away from the rest of the board. So here we can have the antenna uh, 6.5 centimeters apart, which is the desired position that we wanted them. And we also had them fixed so they were nice and parallel for uh, consistent readings. And our final piece of hardware is our custom PCB. Uh, this is the revision two based off of last year's. And what we wanted to add was an extra PCIe slot to accommodate the second X2X that we wanted to use. And so our main accomplishment was taking this uh, eight layer board and adding a second PCIe, as well as optimizing some of the space. So here's the back, you can see in the middle on the left side is the second PCIe. So, All right, I'm sorry, I'm having a little lag on my end. Oh, whoops, I couldn't see it on my end. 
Yeah, Sorry about that. Far. Oh man, yeah, very much lag on my end. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I believe those are the old and new, so you can talk. Uh, about okay, yeah, I can't see it. That's my bad. I'm still stuck on another side. So, uh, taking a look at our old and new um, PCB designs, here we can see uh, on the old one, it's a little bit larger. We ended up optimizing some space and cutting down on size. Also. In the bottom middle, there's on this new board, there's the this yellow rectangle, which uh, is the new PCIe that we added. Uh, we ended up removing one of the HDMIs and the Ethernet, and then optimizing the space and adding this second PCIe. Uh, as you can see, it was a pretty complex board with eight layers, and it ended up being about eight inches by around seven inches. And um, if it changed, this I, is the, yeah. the real. So this pictures. is yeah. Okay, yeah, so on the new pictures, um, you can see uh, the new board, you can see the X2X directly on it. Um, you can see that it's a little bit smaller and these are that's our final board compared to the revision one. Uh, so now we're stepping into the software flow of things. The overall program follows a multi-step process using threads to measure, analyze, and decode Bluetooth signals. The ISM24 is the top level function that controls all of the worker threads, as you can see in the figure. The ISM24 refers to the 2.4 gigahertz band where we are measuring the signals from. So these are the capture and analysis threads. Uh, the capture thread is where we adjust this radio configuration such as the sample size and frequency. When data comes in, it is placed into a frame which is essentially a buffer holding 16 bit complex numbers. When this buffer gets full, some, num some samples are dropped while other samples are sent along to the next frame. A valid frame is then sent to the channelizer thread, which splits up the sample into the 79 Bluetooth channels. These channels start at the 2.402 gigahertz band and continues for every one megahertz. The Bluetooth signal hops over across these frequencies, which prevents interference from other signals. So these are the filter and analysis threads. The filter thread determines the time selection of the frame that contains a Bluetooth signal, and the analysis thread will calculate the channel power for the frame and estimate the noise floor threshold. Both of these threads will help us determine whether or not a frame contains Bluetooth data. If the channel power is greater than the noise threshold, then there's a high chance that we have identified a Bluetooth signal and we'll pass that along. So in the decode thread, a potential Bluetooth frame can be decoded for a Bluetooth access code. This code is estimated based on the number of bit flips required in the capture frame to form a valid access code. So if the frame does contain a Bluetooth access code, then the frame is forwarded to the direction thread. Here, an angle of arrival estimation can then be calculated using the music algorithm on the channelized frame. This data is then saved locally on an SSD. And for our data, we configured our XTRX radio to monitor a slice of the 2.4 gigahertz band for interesting bursts of energy. The waterfall plot shown on the right demonstrates what interesting data will look like for us. When the blue finder detects a channel power above the noise threshold, as mentioned earlier, it'll continue to add frames to the plot until the energy of that signal dies out. The bright small rectangles across the plot are Bluetooth signals. You can note this by their frequency hopping pattern. The faded larger rectangles in the background are distant Wi-Fi signals, which we're not really interested in. So as you can see by the various signals, there's quite a bit of noise we have to deal with when analyzing our data. Overall, this is simply a top level description of the kind of data we're analyzing and interesting frames are decoded and used in our direction finding algorithm as Renny will explain now. Here, I'd like to talk about how we could determine the angle of arrival of an incoming signal. The incoming signals, uh, the incoming Bluetooth signals are received by a linear array of antennas with a known spacing and the varying angle to the signal source can be determined using the phase difference between the signals received by the antennas in the antenna array. The exact algorithm we used is the music algorithm, which is short for a multiple signal classification algorithm. The reason we chose the algorithm is that first, first it's high resolution, even with the presence of noise. And secondly, uh, 
uh, the music algorithm is able to estimate the angle of arrival for multiple signals simultaneously. We implemented the music algorithm in the Rust language, and uh, here are some details on our implementation of the algorithm. The, the music algorithm estimates the autocorrelation matrix using eigenspace method. The algorithm first calculates the sample covariance matrix, and then the algorithm does eigen decomposition on it. We know that the largest eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors span the signal subspace while the rest correspond to the noise space. So what the algorithm does next is it extracts the noise space and then, oh, oh the algorithm them extracts the noise space. And since we know the signal vectors in the signal subspace have to be orthogonal to the noise space, the algorithm creates a bunch of complex sinusoids of various instant angles. And for each of these complex sinusoids, the algorithm measures its level of orthogonality with respect to the noise space that it, it extracted earlier. Finally, the algorithm returns the angle resulting in the highest orthogonality as the estimated angle of arrival. Uh, in our project, we used two antennas on the music algorithm. And here is a demo of our project. Hi, this is our uh, demo video for BlueFinder. This is the um, hardware that we uh, designed hooked up to the uh, NVIDIA Jetson SOM. So uh, we designed this because we needed two PCIEs uh, for the SDRs. So um, this is the first one, the XTRX on the top. This is one on the bottom and it's you know, ready to be hooked up to the antennas. So I wanna compare it with the original. So this is the original right here. Um, differences are we, uh, we got it smaller. We uh, added a second uh, PCIe for an SDR. So this one has it on the bottom. Uh, we got rid of the ethernet. Uh, power is more or less the same. Here is our demo setup. It is in the parking lot of the CACI office so that we can minimize interference. Um, here you can see we have the hardware set up with a monitor to display the results. We have the antenna located far away from the rest of the hardware to hopefully minimize interference. Here is a demo of the software. The transmitter originally located around minus 30 degrees to the left antenna it's now moved to a location around 30 degrees to the antenna. As you can see, the peak of the histogram shifted from minus 30 degrees to positive 30 degrees as we move the transmitter. Now we are moving the transmitter to 60 degrees. The histogram shows a peak at minus 60 degrees, which is correct in terms of the absolute value of the angle, but the sign is flipped. This is a common problem we encountered while testing the system. The estimations previously shown were somewhat accurate in terms of the absolute value of the angle, but that is not always the case. We moved the transmitter back to minus 30 degrees and the result is no longer correct. We gave the histogram some time to settle, but the peak never moved to the desired location. Finally, we moved the transmitter to about minus 80 degrees, and again, the estimation is not correct. Hi, this is our uh, demo video. Oh. <clears throat> So uh, thanks for watching our demo. And uh, before we wrap things up, we'd like to thank CACI and LGS Labs uh, for their mentorship throughout this whole process. Uh, specifically, Jeff, Chris, James, and Eric were all extremely instrumental in us uh, getting to the point that we did. Um, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, we would also like to thank our UCSB mentors, including Dr. Yoga and our TAs, Boning and Trenton. Uh, and we'd also like to thank you for uh, your time, your attention, and putting up with uh, Zoom glitches. Um, we'll take any questions. Uh, this is Kenton. I have uh, the first question that you got to ask is, um, if you had more time, 
what would you do to fix your uh, inversion issue? Um, so um, I suppose the first thing is um, the reason we had this issue is because uh, the drivers that we had, they uh, only, uh, the people who wrote them only expected uh, one radio to be working. So we'd have to make modifications on those drivers. That's the most likely thing that would allow us to use uh, uh, a second radio. So that would be probably like a one to two week uh, uh, endeavor. Um, that's probably where we get the most bang for our buck, I think, right? Uh, if anyone else wants to chime in on that. And then there's a bunch of other things. Like there's actually quite a bit of room uh, to make this a lot better. Um, we can talk about that for a long time. Uh, yeah, be, uh, like, like for example, a couple of the ideas that we had um, regarding some of the issues were uh, we found that sometimes the data, because uh, our Bluetooth, uh, it's going out in every direction and it, we were doing it uh, in a parking lot. Uh, one thing that we thought could be a possible issue is that it could be bouncing off of the ground. And then um, because they're arriving at different times, they could actually like cancel each other out or cause issues with our data. Um, we didn't have enough time, unfortunately, to really dive into specifics on and avoiding that because we were kind of cramped for time on uh, getting our demo set up. But um, we had a bunch of different ideas on things that could be issues. All right, thank you guys. Uh, one question from Justin. Justin, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have one question about the antenna separation you mentioned in the presentation. You, you put antennas uh, 6.5 centimeters apart. Uh, how do you come up with that uh, the number and uh, how do you expect uh, if you use different separation? or the, uh, bring them closer or the separate them a little bit further away? Okay, so um, the 6 point, uh, the 6.25 centimeter separation is lambda over two lambda is the wavelength of uh, the Bluetooth signal. And by that configuration, the, the, there, are, there is a 180 degree of phase uh, difference between the two antennas. And uh, if we increase the antenna spacing, that phase difference might change. And uh, we, and that the algorithm may not work as expected with that uh, changing phase. So we, ch uh, we, uh, we just use lambda over two for the antenna separation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, let's go to the next team, Anchorless. Uh, hello and good morning. Uh, we are team Anchorless and we would like to present to you our capstone project, uh, Self-Positioning Ocean Tether. Nice. Um, so I'm Benny Ortega. I'm project lead and I focus primarily on the photo motor functionality. I'm Ryan Levy. I was in charge of system architecture and solar integration. I'm Winston Lee and I was in charge of GPS and IMU integration. I'm Corey Zhao and I uh, took charge of the control system and cellular communication with Tahara. So for this project, we were presented with a spotter buoy, which is the system shown on the right. Uh, it is a data collection aquatic system that provides real-time measurements for oceanography research. Um, so to remain in a specific location, the buoy needs to be anchored to the ocean floor and retrieval, maintenance, and repositioning requires more time and effort. Uh, to remove that extra overhead, we were tasked with designing a system capable of autonomously repositioning a buoy and keeping it near a desired location. So our team desired a low power system capable of performing such tasks. So we initially sent the command over to cellular connection for the vessel to move towards a desired location. The vessel then proceeds to take the target location and use its current location and orientation to calculate the rudder angle and thruster power needed to navigate to the new location. Once the system reaches its destination, it enters an idle state. So the goal is to always stay within the desired radius 
of the set coordinates, which is initially set as a quarter mile, but can be changed uh, through user input. Um, and it either collects data or awaits retrieval. But wind and ocean currents will likely cause the buoy to drift outside of the allowed radius, at which point it will automatically detect and the buoy will navigate back to the central location. Here's a simple illustration that shows the stages of the system. The boat begins in an idle state and the location has been set to. After some time, the boat will likely drift outside of the allowed radius. So the boat will then trigger some implemented functions to get the rudder angle that will direct the boat to the location and thrust the power necessary to propel the boat. Once it returns to the central location, which is also the goal state, it returns to its idle state. So I'm gonna go over the hardware that we're using in this project. For our controller, we're using a Raspberry Pi Zero W. Uh, the storage on that is just a micro SD card. And one of the main reasons we use this is it has a lot of different pins. Uh, that we can connect all of our other devices to. Uh, the next most important thing, uh, this is gonna be a boat basically that's out on the water for long periods of time. So we need to be able to recharge it using solar. So we have a large 25 watt solar panel connected to a solar charge controller. And that's charging a pretty big 12 volt battery. Um, and then we have a power boost connected to that to get the right uh, level of voltage to the Raspberry Pi. We also have a secondary 3.7 volt battery that's monitored by a fuel gauge. Um, and that using that, we can get the battery level of that at any time to measure what percentage it's at. To move the boat, we have a thruster and that's uh, connected to an electronic speed controller. And that thruster needs 12 volts to run. So that is directly connected to the solar charge controller. And then that is controlled with the Raspberry Pi to the pin there. Next, we need to be able to move the boat in different directions. So we have a rudder, which is attached to a push rod, uh, powered by, or like turned by a servo motor. And that angle is uh, given by the Raspberry Pi. Uh, next, we need to get the orientation and current location. Uh, to get that data, we have a digital compass, IMU, uh, and then we have a GPS. Lastly, to communicate with the device, over cellular, we have a cellular modem and that has a nano SIM in it. And that way we can send commands uh, from, from a website. So basically anything that can connect to the internet. Uh, for solar power, so like I said, we have a large 25 watt solar panel to continuously charge both of our batteries uh, whenever the sun is up. And that here's one of our batteries. It's a 12 volt uh, lead acid battery. Uh, and that is all connected to a power boost, which can charge our Raspberry Pi along with a secondary battery and then our fuel gauge to measure the battery level. And this uh, will all last over 72 hours when it's fully charged. Uh, so that's three days without uh, needing to be in the sun at all. So ideally it's gonna get at least sun, sun each day. So this should never really die out. Um, like we touched on before, the Raspberry Pi Zero W is our main microcontroller. Um, <clears throat> it has a one gigahertz single core CPU. And the main reason that we chose it was for its low power consumption as the system is run on solar power. It also has the right amount of ports without being overkill. And uh, we connect our digital compass, our GPS, our server motor, speed control, cellular modem, fuel gauge, and power boost to it through I squared C, UR, and other GPIO pins. <clears throat> uh, to calculate the data we need, um, we use the GPS Adafruit Ultimate GPS, which connects through UR. It has a 10 hertz update rate, and based on our testing, has an accuracy within 50 feet. And to get the compass bearing, we use the compass 12. It connects through I squared C and it returns a bearing with four significant dig digits and has up to 100 hertz update rate. We use a Blue Robotics T200 thruster, which is one of the most popular underwater thrusters, um, to propel the vessel towards the desired location. Uh, and then we use the SG90 servo motor, which has an eight kilogram per centimeter stall torque and has a zero to 180 ha degree hand rotation. The vessel is navigated with changes in rudder angle which are brought about with the push rod connected to the servo motor hand. 
cellular modem we use is the Hologram Nova R410. This modem uses 4G LTE, which has a decent data rate, but more importantly also has lower power consumption. To interface with this, we, uh, we use directly from the desktop computer. So in a separate file, we import anchorless.py, and then we can use uh, the helper functions that we made to send specific commands. This file sends HTTP requests to hologram.io cloud, and then they forward the message to the modem. Every getter function has also a timestamp return because there's a little delay between the modem and the computer. So our system has two different uh, control systems. The first one uh, takes in the Haversen distance between the GPS location and the target location, and that is used to calculate the thruster power. This function is a two piecewise linear function. The first piece is a constant high value at a long distance, and then at short distance, the thruster power is linearly proportional to the distance. The second control system is uh, for the IMU, so it calculates the angle of error between the IMU and the Haversen bearing, and that is used to calculate the rudder controller. We use a simple PID controller to calculate this because we need it to get in the right direction as quickly as possible. To make sure that the buoy system stays within our set location, we loop through one of two states. <clears throat> in the first state, we check the current location of the buoy using the GPS. We then use the Haversen firmware to calculate the distance between the current location and the desired location. We then check <clears throat> if this distance puts our buoy outside the uh, allowed radius. And if not, then the system goes or stays in an idle state. However, if for some reason, such as the waves of the wind, the system ends up outside of the idle state, <clears throat> we will use our IMU to get a compass reading and use that combined with the distance away from our target location to calculate rudder direction and thruster power. We'll send this info to power our motor and, and set our rudder direction until we navigate back to our desired location and we'll re-enter the idle state. So for final product, we we're able to connect to the provided hologram.io dashboard website. This website is useful because we can monitor uh, specific stats on the modem, like the monitor, the carrier, the connection time, data usage, and the list of messages sent and received. This is what the uh, final boat prototype looks like. It's a marine vehicle that can replace the typical anchor system with an autonomous repositioning vehicle that can uh, go anywhere, any GPS location that you set to it, um, and it can carry anything behind it. So this is the basic structure for a software inside the Raspberry Pi. So our main.py will import all the other files that implements one specific part of the system. And the main.py has an initial function and the control loop afterwards. And then inside, uh, it's a waterproof uh, IP67 rated box that's attached to the top of the uh, surfboard that we're using. Um, and then, so up top, you can see are the two batteries that we're using and our solar charge controller to uh, power them. And then right here, you can see the, is the solar panel cable and that uh, connects out to the left with a waterproof seal uh, connecting it, which is out on the board, as you saw. Uh, we then have a power boost which connects to all the other devices and powers them. We have an ESC there to give 12 volts uh, to the thruster, and that also connects out to the left through a waterproof seal. The Raspberry Pi there is in the middle. Uh, we have a screw terminal on top of it to connect to all of our other devices uh, fairly easily. And then we have our modem, which is connected via USB to communicate with it the fuel gauge there to measure the battery level, uh, the servo motor to turn the angle of the push rod, which thus uh, turns the rudder so we can move our boat. And finally, to get the current orientation and location, we have our compass and GPS connected there. And that's what it looks like inside of the box. And here we'll be demonstrating the completed anchorless prototype. This was the first test we were able to do this year on the water. Here we perform basic forward and backward movement by sending commands over SSH. Later, we were able to test in a larger body of water at Lake Los Carneros. Here we could demonstrate turning and have it navigate farther distances on its own. 
Here, the rudder is automatically positioning itself to redirect the boat towards a particular compass direction. It's using the data from the CMPS-12 inside the box to determine which way to turn. There, you just heard the thruster turning on and calibrating. It is left at a low power state until the thruster is needed to conserve energy. Once calibrated, the thruster turns on, and the boat moves forward until it is within the range of the target GPS location. We're keeping the boat tethered for these tests because the automatic driving is much harder to control in small areas such as this because of the delay on cellular commands and the accuracy of the GPS. Our implementation works best on larger, more open bodies of water. We are, however, able to manually drive it over SSH to demonstrate the boat's turning ability and maneuverability. As you can see, the boat moves fairly quickly on the water. This, however, is actually still a very low speed for this thruster. If needed, it could be set to run about three times as fast as this. We just have it set to this speed because this is what we determined was necessary for this particular project. We were able to drive to the left or right with ease, and the automatic system does the same thing to drive towards the set location. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching. I think there was a lot of lag. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Boning, go back to the presentation. Okay. Um, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge everyone who helped make this project possible. Uh, thank you to our project mentors at UCSB Coast Lab, Nid Nizico, and Christopher Morin. And thank you to the Capstone staff, uh, Professor Yoganda Zukapali, and TAs Trenton and Boning. Okay. I think that's it. Questions, anyone? Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Um, what about the stability in rough seas or stormy weather when, when you have a strong wind blowing? Have you considered any uh, control systems that you have to use during that, those times? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, this prototype, uh, their plan is to create like a larger hole underneath it with uh, perhaps some lead to weigh it down. And that should, first of all, make it more stable on the water so it won't flip. Um, to account for while driving, uh, we don't have anything to exactly account for that, like to measure like wind speed or anything. Uh, but over time, the navigation still should be able to uh, continue to turn towards the location it needs to get to. Um, and if it's always pointing that way and always driving towards it, no matter how much drift uh, is there, it should still be able to make it. Uh, the radius that we're thinking of for this project is relatively big. Uh, so it's not like a, uh, like a specific point. It's just mainly to make sure it doesn't drift extremely far away uh, and that we don't lose it. Um, similar to like an anchor with like a very long cable or a chain. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is uh, Mark Kawakami. Did you spend a lot of time uh, researching all these uh, different pieces? I mean, there's, there's a lot of pieces in here, like the GPS and the compass. Um, uh, did you have to go and, you know, like buy several and compare them or were you pretty accurate and uh, select in your selection. Yeah, that was definitely a big part of this, especially with us all being separated. Uh, so a lot of us had to get duplicates of some of the parts and there were definitely probably would be some other parts that we would have chosen. We did have to replace the compass at one point because the first one we got wasn't giving us the readings we needed. 
So we used ended up using a the a CMPS twelve uh, instead of our original BNO IMU. Um, the as far as all the other parts, we were pretty lucky on getting them like able to work. Uh, definitely more if we were allowed more time, we could probably look into more reliable uh, pieces as there are some connectivity issues uh, sometimes, but uh, under good circumstances, it does work fairly well. But yeah, I definitely agree that we could try to get some better pieces uh, just to make it more reliable. And then one more question, sir. The, um, the, the solar controller that, that had all the things like, um, like protection for uh, charging the uh, lead acid so that you don't do like overcharging or all that stuff so that it would shut off when it's fully charged. That took care yeah. of it. You didn't have to take care that, of it. Yeah, that automatically did that. Oh, and then also one thing I forgot to mention, we had, uh, because we're using a lead acid battery, uh, it gives us, I forget the exact chemical, but it gives off a gas. And so we have two waterproof vents that are on that box uh, to help aerate that out as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's not like airtight, but water doesn't get in. This is Kenton. I have a quick question. Um, so this had an algorithm uh, that would basically, uh, while it was at rest, it would be detecting its position. And then it would, um, you know, activate when it got out to a certain distance and so forth, and then come back and go back into its uh, at rest state. How close were you uh, um, able to get to, to test that entire uh, algorithm, that entire, uh, say, you know, exiting at rest state, uh, moving the, the, the craft back to position and entering the at rest state again? Uh, yeah, so we weren't able to test this in the, in the ocean yet. Uh, we were, uh, our main tests were at Los, uh, Lake Los Caneros, like I said, uh, but we were able to demonstrate that when we set a new uh, GPS location, uh, cellular, we, it would uh, turn on and start turning towards that location. Um, and then we, because our, the lake was pretty small, we couldn't get it. We weren't really able to test that it like came into a location and then like turned off just because the range uh, would be a lot more specific. Uh, so there could be some issues there, uh, theoretically. Um, yeah, that's the extent we, that we were able to this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, this is a Sea Shield project. Uh, my name is Christopher Scott. Okay, there we go. Uh, I'm in charge of drone construction and drone control using drone kit. Hi, my name is Eric. I worked on the Android application and establishing communication between the app and the drone. Hi, my name is Andrew Cesus and I was responsible for image detection and I assisted in drone construction. Hi, I'm Andrew Barry, and I was responsible for the Android application, the video feed, and the real-time rust detection. Hi, my name is Derek Chang. I worked on curating the image data set as well as working on the image detection algorithm. So one of the main issues plaguing the US Navy revolves around corrosion building up on naval ships while on active duty. Due to the harsh environment of the open sea, the oxidation rates are heightened, which can lead to deteriorating conditions on naval ships. As a result, the U.S. Navy spends close to $3 billion annually on repairs. So like I said, the main issue revolves around the interaction between the saltwater and naval ships. Naval ships are usually constructed out of steel, which is heavily affected by rust and corrosion. Unfortunately, the saltwater is highly conductive, and this results in heightened oxidation rates as opposed to fresh water or other substances. And this can lead to the structural integrity of naval ships being compromised and even breaking down. 
our project at Sea Shield seeks to ameliorate the issue by having a drone with rust detection capabilities and a built-in sprayer to help apply a fix to the corrosion. A bandage fix for this issue is to apply a rust inhibiting liquid to these patches of corrosion to slow down the oxidation rates and to protect the steel from oxygen and those ships can get back and get actual repairs. Many of these places are in hard to reach locations so our drone can help reduce the manpower required to keep these ships underway. So there are three major components of our project. The first one being the drone body, which is the vehicle in which we'll be applying the rust inhibiting liquid. It also contains a water pump, a sprayer, and tanks that carry the liquid, as well as the flight controller, jets of nano, and camera. Next part is the video feed and rust detection. So we train a detection algorithm in order to detect the rust, and it shows the results along with the bounding box in real time. And the last component is our Android application, which controls the drone, whether it be taking off, landing, reverting to manual control of the drone, like pivoting left, right, up, or down, or spraying the pumps. The first component of the drone um, we had to decide on was the motors. The motors uh, provide the thrust. Um, these were selected for uh, propeller size and max thrust. We went with a hexcopter, so max thrust is um, the combination of the propeller and the motor uh, times six. Uh, this is a, approximately a 38 inch frame to allow for 18 inch propellers, which is more thrust per, per rotation and less power consumption um, from the motor. Flight controller is a hex cube orange. Uh, it's got triple redundant IMUs, which are inertial measurement units that provide the heading and accelerometers uh, barometer, uh, just environmental um, measurements. It's temperature controlled and it, we installed the Ardu pilot firmware. Uh, the lithium polymer battery was chosen for high capacity for high flight time and a high instantaneous amp draw. Uh, the flight time should be 22 minutes, but in practice, uh, we experienced up to 30. Uh, the sprayer system was mounted on the bottom. We just used standard 12 volt pump with 110 PSI. The companion computer is NVIDIA and Jetson Nano. Uh, we used it for image processing, live video stream to the app, rust detection on the video stream, uh, drone control using DroneKit Python library, and installed a network interface card for a wireless access point for wireless communication. This is our initial construction. Uh, it had a lot of weight shifting problems due to the slosh of the water and uh, a lot of leaks. So we... Um, changed. Okay, so we uh, adjusted that to vertical tanks that wouldn't slash as much. Um, so this is our final construction. That's the Jetson Nano. Uh, that's the flight controller. And these are the tanks and sprayer and the pumps underneath. And uh, you can see the camera on the Jetson Nano right there. Uh, this is our manual test flight. Here's the video of our drone flying simply in manual mode. In order to control the drone, we designed an Android app that we could host on a tablet. Uh, we built the app using Android Studio. We leveraged two libraries. We use GStreamer to help us create a live video stream from the drone. And we use JSCH to help us make the SSH connections we needed to send commands. The tablet connects to the drone initially using the Wi-Fi module that's on board the Jetson Nano. It is able to establish a local network through which uh, the tablet can SSH into.
So starting with the buttons on the tablet, when you initially press a button that has a certain command, it activates the on-click listener. And inside the on-click listener, uh, it has like a thing to activate a function, which will create a SSH instance. And on that SSH instance, it then transmits a text command depending on what button you pressed. And that text command is written to the Jetson Nano. And then the SSH uh, channel is closed. Once the command is sent to the Nano, it's written to that commands.txt file, which is interpreted by a Python script that is running on the Nano. And this Python script is able to, it's like it matches and reads each line of the commands file and matches it to a given another Python script, depending on which uh, command it reads. And that Python script uses the drone kit Python module, which translates Python.
that's it. We, we would like to thank uh, our professor yoga and our teaching assistants, uh, Boeing and Trenton for all of their help uh, throughout this process, as well as our uh, sponsor, the NAPSI guys, Ramon, Alan, and Armin. And that's it. And for some additional information, you could take a look at our project website as well as the ECSB capstone website. Thank you. And we're ready for any questions now if there are any. Um, that were you guys able to fly the latest build where you had vertical water, I'm sorry, um, vertical chemical canisters instead of the one with horizontal chemical canisters? Uh, yeah, we we flew it for a bit, but um, we crashed it so many times that it just became unstable. And even after we tried to recalibrate everything and we weren't able to get a video of flying it with the vertical ones. So we thought the vertical tanks would help, but it actually didn't reduce um, the oscillations and stabilization as much as we wanted it to. All right, thanks. Uh, Any more? And was there, was this, uh, this is Mark. Um, I was just wondering, if, was there a reference design uh, for with the Jetson and uh, a drone? Because that seems fairly fairly complex to build. So, just curious. Like a reference? Well, so I mean, we I mean, there's like a a PX4 chart that kind of lays out all the components and stuff. But no, we didn't. We just um, basically kind of winged the parts. Uh, we we got. We researched it as much as we possibly could to make sure they're all compatible, but we did have um, some ESCs that were meant for smaller motors. So like the, I don't know what it's called, but the bandwidth between the power phasing it sends to the motors wasn't large enough because the smaller motors had less electromagnets. So we had to replace those, um, but we didn't, we didn't, no, we didn't. Yeah, that's, like that, that's great. I mean, it just feels like there would be a lot of, uh... Even, even without the tanks, a lot of uh, uh, experimentation on like avoiding crashes and things like that, just to, to control the unit. So, oh yeah, I mean we we crashed it a bunch and broke a bunch of propellers. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, there, there was a lot of experimentation. Okay. Hi, this is Justin. Um, I have one question about the stability. So. Uh, Typical drone, uh, uh, the control, uh, you you have a uh, the predefined weight and uh, geometry, and then you just uh, control uh, its own flight. But with this spray uh, application, uh, there will be uh, the, if for example, weight itself might change uh, as you. Uh, apply more spray, and then while you are applying spray, there will be uh, different uh, the momentum. So how how do you, uh, how do you guys address this stability issue? Was there uh, any significant kickback, or uh, was it uh, uh, handled okay at this time? So yeah, there was a lot of kickback from like the even just like the weight shifting from the water sloshing. Um, the the weight difference in water going down didn't really matter and uh wind was actually a bigger factor than spraying but uh we tried to adjust the coefficients of the pid algorithm um but that kind of threw it off a lot and actually ended up smashing it into the ground uh the the original ardu pilot stabilization algorithm actually worked fairly well. Um, our main problem having oscillations and stabilization is that we went for a two to one maximum thrust to weight ratio. We underestimated our weight and I think we um, underestimated the maximum thrust as well. So we had actually probably like a 1.5 to one maximum thrust to weight ratio. Um, I mean, I would recommend at least four to one for any kind of heavy drone. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, 
Mm, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Let's go to the next team track. Um, okay, so. Hello everyone, our project uh, name is TRAC, which stands for Temperature Regulated Analysis of Coagulopathy, and this is our final spring presentation. Hi, so I'm Corbin, uh, the project lead, and I was responsible for PCB and peripheral design, as well as hardware integration. I'm David, I've been doing a lot of the STM32 programming, uh, specifically the temperature control system. I'm Lucas, I've been working on software, mainly our GUI and our algorithm design. I'm Albert, and I've been working on PCB schematic assistance and temperature sensor protocols. And I'm Bryson, and I've been working on firmware design and hardware peripheral integration. So in our presentation, we'll be going over our problem description, as well as the block diagram for our device, the PCB designs that we have, and the final assembled device. We'll then be finishing off with the software for our temperature control, UI UX design, as well as the firmware of our device. So the problem we're facing is called trauma-induced coagulopathy, or TIC. This is the body's inability to properly clot blood during a physical trauma incident. This is a very prevalent condition as trauma is a leading cause of death worldwide, and TIC occurs in approximately one quarter of all trauma patients. Early detection and treatment is critical to patient health, as nearly 30% of TIC-related deaths occur within the first hour. Fortunately, current testing machines are large and stationary and require the patient to be transferred to the hospital in order to perform tests. Additionally, it can take up to 30 minutes to, to return test results. This is unideal for patient health as by this point in time, they may have lost significant blood and be in critical condition. Therefore, together with our sponsor, Aptitude, we set out to build a handheld portable TSE detector that can deliver results within two minutes and allow first responders to quickly identify the deadly scene on scene and provide the proper help. At the center of our system is a microcontroller. We chose to go with an STM32 F4 series microcontroller for one main reason being we have um, built-in support for a touchscreen. We're gonna host our GUI on this touchscreen and we communicate with the touchscreen model itself via I squared C and the actual LCD screen over MIPI DSI, which is a high-speed serial interface. This microcontroller also has great compatibility for flash memory, which we communicate with over SPI. In order to actually analyze the blood itself, we use our sponsor Aptitude's blood chip, which has three main electrodes. The reference and control electrodes are connected directly to a potentiostat, while the third working electrode is connected via a MUX to allow for different test points. The MSTAT Pico is simply a potentiostat that performs the electrochemical analysis and communicates with our microcontroller via UART. The blood test requires very strict temperature conditions, so we added a Peltier module, which is a solid state heat device. It's connected via an H-bridge, which allows us to switch the polarity of the current and either heat up or cool down the testing environment, depending on conditions. We also have a temperature sensor, which we interface with via I squared C, that allows us to maintain the proper temperature throughout the tests. Finally, we have a battery and battery management system, which provides power to both the Peltier and all of our digital logic. Our device is broken up into multiple boards, and this is due to the uh, inherent layout flexibility as well as the size and complexity constraints of our enclosure. And so this is on the right is our main board schematic. Uh, as you can see, it comes with the STM32 plus external memory. This gives us access to a very powerful low power processor as well as extra working memory uh, in this form of QSPY flash. We also have a battery management system and power regulation, which supports all the typical features such as overcurrent, over temperature protection, and other safety features that you'd probably need in a LiPo charging circuit. And finally, on the main board, we have the peripheral board connections. These are connections such as the MIPI DSI port and our proprietary 10 pin peripheral board connector. So this is our main board layout. We went with a four layer PCB, for optimal cost and efficiency. Uh, we also separated out the power plane and the ground planes to make sure we could get the optimal noise isolation between the two signaling lanes on the top and bottom. We also have an optional communications PCB attachment point where we can attach anything from Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, LoRa, Zigbee, any type of communications protocol chip that you could think of. We also have a sleep mode battery, which will keep the real timing clock of the STM32 engaged even in the event of a main 
LiPo battery power failure. We also have uh, debug and programming ports to make sure that we can program this board in a development environment. And just for optimal signal integrity to the MIPI DSI, we decided to route them using a differential pair routing methodology. Here's the schematic for the peripheral board, which performs uh, temperature control and conducts blood tests. There are a few things that I like to highlight, first of which is the temperature sensor, which gives us an accurate reading of the surface of the Peltier so we know exactly what temperature the blood chip is. Next is the H-bridge, which allows us to switch between heating and cooling functions of the Peltier. There's the MSTAT PICO, which connects to the blood chip to perform the coagulopathy test. The MUX, which allows the PICO to test multiple points on the blood chip. For this blood chip, there are three different test points. And finally, the mainboard connector, which supplies both 3.3 volt regulated DC and unregulated DC directly from the battery. It also allows the microcontroller to communicate with the temperature sensor, H-bridge, and PICO. For the layout of our peripheral board, we have a two-layer board with drilled holes for the Peltier and the heat sink mounting, as well as a copper-free area to help insulate the Peltier. The MSTAT PICO is positioned on headers for easy removal while also being in proximity to the blood chip to reduce noise during tests. The main sensor on our system is for electrochemical analysis is called the MSTAT PICO. It is a potentia potentiostat mo module with nanoamp accuracy that performs the measurement procedure developed by aptitude. Uh, in short, it measures the concentration of fibrinogen, a crucial protein for blood coagulation, and the lack of this protein is the main cause of trauma-induced coagulopathy specifically. The MSTAP PICO uh, has a fully capable microcontroller unit on it that is capable of controlling GPIO pins and executing measurement protocols written in a reduced character scripting language called MethodScript. So this is our assembled device. And on the right, you can see we went with a 3D printed enclosure. And so this enclosure has a USB-C type uh, port at the bottom for charging. Uh, this USB-C port supports uh, USB 2.0 power delivery spec, as well as the USB type C charging spec. Uh, the aptitude blood chip is inserted at the top of the device into the temperature controlled environment chamber. And the Peltier that controls this temperature controlled uh, environment chamber dumps heat into the heat sink, which then gets vented out the left side of our device. To supply this airflow to our heat sink, we have a fan on the rear of our device drawing cool air in from a different side of the face facing side. This device also supports a large four inch touchscreen interface, as well as rear access to the batteries and the debug ports. As we mentioned earlier, the blood chip needs to be at a specific operating temperature in order to get the most accurate results. So here's what we came up with to solve this problem. The microcontroller sends a PWM signal to the enable pin on the H bridge. The higher the duty cycle of the signal, the more hot or cold the Peltier gets. So at a given temperature, which is supplied by the user, the microcontroller needs to dynamically change the duty cycle. So the Peltier reaches the target temperature as quickly as possible while maintaining the temperature despite external environmental factors. To solve the problem of dynamically changing the duty cycle, we decided to use a PID controller. It is a closed feedback loop that uses error to apply correction at the output. The output is the sum of proportional, integral, and derivative terms, hence the acronym PID. This controller is tuned using three constants. KP, KI, and KD. Here's what we've achieved so far in terms of temperature control. When cooling from 25 Celsius to 15 Celsius, you can guarantee a stable temperature in 20 seconds with plus or minus 0.5 degree oscillations. And when heating from 25 Celsius to 35 Celsius, we can guarantee a stable temperature in only five seconds with plus or minus 0.15 degree oscillations. However, lately we've been getting only plus or minus 0 0.05 degree oscillations on our current prototype. So at a high level, our software has three main functions. The first of which is to communicate and control the, our hardware peripherals in order to properly execute a blood test. Uh, secondly, we do some data processing 
uh, on the raw data received from the MSTAT PICO as a result of the electrochemical analysis of the blood test to, in order to generate and display the results of the blood test. And then lastly, we host a easy to use graphical touchscreen interface application that is for high, high stress environments. Um, overall, all the software is executed by our micro microcontroller running free RTOS in order to properly schedule tasks. For efficient execution of our program, we decided to go for a three-threaded design with one thread for each main function, as Bryson said earlier. Our display control thread handles all user interface and updates the GUI, which follows the model view controller design platform. Our main control thread communicates with each all our peripherals and performs our primary computations. The temperature control thread maintains the proper temperature environment during testing. This is not necessary to be ran continually, so we dynamically wake and sleep this thread as necessary in order to save resources. For our shared data, which include temperature reading and test results, we use mutexes in order to ensure cons consistent behavior. So looking at our firmware, uh, first it's important to address uh, the MIPI DSI driver. Uh, we had to make uh, heavy modifications to this driver in order to work with our microcontroller. Uh, we actually spent majority of the last couple of weeks just getting this to work. Uh, overall, it uh, controls the drawing of our LCD display. Um, even though we got it to work, we only were able to get it, we only had time to get it to work in the lowest speed uh, settings. So as a result, the redraw rate of our screen is lower than we'd like it. And then second, we're looking at the touchscreen control driver. We also had to make heavy uh, modifications to this driver in order to work with our system. And it uh, detects and relays touch events to our application. Uh, next, we have peripheral control, which may, is mainly in the form of ser serial communication with the MSTAT PICO and temperature sensor, as well as the PID control implementation for our thermal system. And then lastly, we have backend communication with the application in the form of RTOS messages and queues for passing data and receiving instructions for procedure scheduling. Procedure scheduling. For our user interface, we tried to make it simple and straightforward as possible. Uh, to reduce issues under stressful circumstances. And it follows the testing sequence that is illustrated on the top right image. The home screen is a base instance that contains a begin test option, which upon selection will transition the interface <clears throat> to a setup screen in which the temperature will be displayed and stabilized. It then asks the user to insert the chip with the patient's blood and a prompt to restart will appear if the components are not detected properly. Once the blood chip has been confirmed, then the test will commence while the temperature remains at stable levels. The results will automatically be displayed and hitting the finish icon will return the user to the home, base home instance. And our demo will show how the device works in action. So before I play this demo video, I, think it's, I wanna address the fact that the uh, user interface seems to be located at the upper region of the screen. Uh, this is because our system ended up not having enough RAM on board to support a full frame buffer. Uh, initially, we uh, our design included external RAM in order to counteract this problem, but due to supply shortages of the microcontroller packages we needed, the uh, package we ended up with did not have enough pins to support this external memory. Uh, this, uh, in turn, limited our uh, UI design uh, capabilities. So to begin the test, you press start. You may notice the slow refresh right here as we're all the drivers. And as you can see the temperature screen, it is converging on the target temperature of 35 degrees Celsius very quickly. Once it reaches the temperature, it transitions to insert chip. When you insert the proprietary aptitude chip, the system will automatically detect the chip insertion and fluid fill and go to the measurement screen. So right now the MSTAT Pico is performing the blood analysis and when it's the it'll transition to the result screen. So now we're gonna demonstrate an improper interaction with our device. So pressing start as usual, you'll enter the temperature control, control screen where we're quickly converge back to the target temperature. And now the user will uh, insert the chip incorrectly with no fluid inserted. And as you can see, the device will not detect it and the user will be prompted to an error screen.
it. Uh, we'd like to thank Professor Yoga and TAs Trenton and Boning for helping us out throughout this year on this project. Uh, we also like to have a big thanks to uh, Aptitude, our project sponsor, as well as Tyler, who's been our main contact at the company. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, this is Bruce Kennedy uh, with Soft Acuity. Uh, nice work. Uh, looks like uh, clever, clever, inner, uh, clever use of the of the chip from analog devices there. Um, I did have a question about the accuracy. Did you guys test this against some of the gold standard devices that are out there? So uh, currently, Aptitude is still in the, the development process for their science behind this device. So uh, we weren't exactly able to get access to any baseline measurements from industry machines. But I assume that uh, their results are comparable to uh, hospital machines. Okay, thank you. I have a question. It um, seems that you guys have some expansion ports. Um, what future ideas do you guys have on how to actually util uh, utilize that? Uh, so some of the expansion ports that we have, uh, as I said before, the wireless communications, the idea originally behind that was to have uh, kind of wireless access to remote servers so that we could store user information on them and sync across multiple different devices. Uh, that was actually one of our stretch goals originally. However, due to, you know, the chip shortage and all the issues surrounding that, our project got delayed massively. And so we weren't able to get around to it. Um, but there's also some other stuff too, in terms of expandability, uh, again, the external RAM for a better frame buffer and more advanced algorithms, uh, dependent on our sponsor and as well as, you know, the faster implementation of our touch screen drivers, we have some other issues with that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, this is Kenton. Um, struggling through uh, using a chip that you hadn't intended uh, is pretty nice to see that you got something working and you use the top part of the screen. Uh, can you describe a little bit uh, replacing your memory chip with the one, you know, one that you hadn't intended? Was that a pin for pin type replacement or did you have to do a bunch of stuff in the system to get it working? We actually couldn't even get a chip. We couldn't get any external RAM. Uh, the external memory we have is just flash for program execution. And so we're actually just using the built-in internal uh, SRAM inside of the STM32. Ah, fantastic. Props to you. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, looks like that's it. Thank you, guys. Good work. Wow. Uh, next presentation, Cat. My name is Jia Shi Tang. I'm the team leader, and I am in charge of the software development on MCU. Hi, my name is Zhou Yu. I'm in charge of the hardware part and the motor part. Hi, I'm Min Wen. Uh, I'm in charge of the hardware part and motor part too. Um, this is Curdy. Uh, I developed a GPU-based program on JSON to perform object detection. Hi, this is Zhang Lu. Zhang Lu Wang, and I'm in charge of the software part on the GPU and also the 3D model. Okay, I will introduce our project. Our project is to provide uh, technical support for I uh, certain C uh, machines. A high end in uh, electron microscope is attached to the uh, surgical uh, instrument. Uh, this microscope is very fragile. Any slight co uh, collision will cause damage to the microscope. Our project is based on this foundation to prevent any collisions that may occur. And uh, uh, in our project, we use a deep camera to detect the location of the object. When the distance between two objects is too close, a warning will be triggered. Our pr uh, project prepare an audio uh, alarm system for this to remind the operator. 
in our system, the robotic arm will always remain in the center of the image to ensure that the robotic arm can be tracked in real time. Uh, there are two sides of our system that you can see in the slide. There are two mounting points to mount our systems. Now, let me introduce our system design block diagram. Firstly, the JSON part. There are three main functions are built in JSON. There are object detection, arm tracking, and multi system communication. The JSON would use UART to communicate with STM32 and send the direction signal. STM32 would translate the direction signal from JSON to step motor driver by sending PWM signal to step motor. Then the motor would rotate camera by 3D printed mount, and the camera would capture the real time picture to send back the, to the JSON and build a complete circle. We would use one more similar system with another angle to achieve the result with a better precision. And the JSON, uh, we, the JSON would communicate with these two systems to do the final, uh, to do the final decision about the blocking object. They are the hardware part we are going to use in our project: the uh, STM32 motor driver and the stem motor part. Next, I want to introduce the core hardware in our project the depth detecting camera. Uh, we use the Intel RealSense uh, B435i as our depth detection camera. This depth detection camera uses the active IR technology. Uh, the, the image on the bottom, bottom right shows how the active IR works. Uh, the, there are an IR projector, projector on the depth detection camera. It will send, it will project the IR ray actively. And there are also two IR receivers on the depth detection camera. It will, it will receive the reflected IR ray. The depth detection camera will calculate out the depth or the distance with the differences on time of, the, of receiving the two uh, IR ray. Uh, Meanwhile, as a, depth, as a camera, this depth detection camera also have a high resolution RGB camera. Um, this, set of, this set of equipment also have easy, easy, easy SDK for most programming language. Uh, however, this system requires USB 3.1 to communicate with the microcontroller. This prevents us from uh, doing a uh, building our project on some simple uh, microcontroller like STM32. It and and here is our 3D printing mount that will be mounted our camera on. As the GIF showing on the right hand side, you can see our mount will be able to turn 3D or uh, 330 degrees and turning angle for both vertically and horizontally. And we will use two sets of the, the, the mounted for the different perspective points. Our program will based on the car detection to detect the whole robot arm. First, we will generate the car maps from the RGB image. As shown in the right hand side, you can see the green object. We are uh, set the range <coughs> to that um, color range. So we will first get the 2D array of zeros and 255s and marks the pixels of the select camera, uh, the colors range with the uh, 255. And then we will use the color max to return a geometric center as shown in the red dot in the image. And our program are based on the OpenCV2 package and we will use the center point to track the robot arm. Once the red dot uh, exists the blue boundary, it will trick the uh, upright and down left uh, command to the STM32. Our first attempt is to build the, our project on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, however, due to, due to the limitation of the Raspberry Pi, we can only use the CPU to build our project. However, 
uh, the CPU is not so powerful. We have to, we cannot do all the, we can do not, we cannot do uh, all detection of all the points at the same time. We have to pick several points on the robotic arm to uh, cut down the loop numbers. Uh, however, we tried a lot of attempts to make the make our project looks real time. However, the, we still have a very low FPS, so that it's not it looks not so real time. So we have to move to our current design on Jensen. Uh, so then we try to develop a GPU based program that and write on JSON with faster float point 32 on GPU. Our program is able to perform detection behavior to all direction. And it is able to perform nice filter to image to make our system more robust. Um, here is our image processing algorithm for color master with CUDA enabled GPU. We are able to perform our own kernel function to all pixels on RGB frame matrix simultaneously. We perform kernel functions um, to all pixels to remove tiny outliers. Uh, and you can see in the top right, uh, the left one has some uh, tiny uh, uh, noise points and uh, the right one is uh, is uh, applying filter and the noise is removed. And uh, we also use uh, Intel's whole filling to um, predict the invalid points. Is this is very important since RGB frame and the depth frame are not perfectly aligned. Uh, we will see what will happen in the next slide. If, if bonding the, is in whole, something unexpected will happen. Here is um, our object detection algorithm. Our GPU can perform padding on original image. Um, we perform padding algorithm several times, then do matrix subtraction to n plus one's padding and n's padding, and we get the bond. Uh, then we cover the uninterested point with red. With a color detection, we can distinctly ignore the bond and the outbound. Um, our algorithm is that after finding the boundary for all pixels on inner bound matching nearest the pixel on outbound that has similar depth value and return the minimum distance between inner and outbound. The float, uh, the float of our main program is that we have a top layer program which is, which is called top. This top will start all the processing in the, our project. Uh, when we start the top, it will first start the streaming and the object detection processing. This processing will communicate with the depth detection camera to get the color frame and depth frame. Uh, this processing will also do all the color detection and the object detection. This processing will keep on going in the whole progress and it will send back blocking information back to the top layer. Meanwhile, this processing will also send the color center, which, is, which, will, which, will, which contains the color center we get from color detection. We use, this, we use the color center information to in, in tracking processing so that we can focus focus our camera on the robotic arm. Last but not least, the top, uh, the top processing will communicate with another system. The build of another system is similar to this, but one, is, but one of them is master, but another one is a slave. Uh, after, communication, after communication with another system, the, two, the master will decide if is the robotic arm is really blocked. If it if it seems that if it seems that it's blocked, they will send a audio uh, alarm to make to let the user know that the block the robotic arm is blocked. Here is our demo video. Here we can see the outer line and the inner line. 
We will get the depth information on those two lines and compare their depths. If any point steps in the inner line is similar to the outer line, it will trigger the beep warning. Here we can see that when hands get close to the arm, it won't trigger the warning because the program is designed to avoid the human's hands, since the doctor will control the arm by their hands. On the video stream, we can see that blue and green dots is the collision points. So here is our dual camera system. You can see one is mounted on the surgery machine and another one is mounted in 98 degree angles from the first camera. For each camera, they are able to turn 180 degrees horizontally and vertically. In this way, we are able to capture blind angles from each camera. Here, we can see two streams from each camera. The blue and the green dot is showing collision points on robotic arm and the blocking object. Once any of the camera detect the blocking object is close to robotic arm, it will trigger the beep as warning. Here, yeah. finally, we want to thank thank our response sponsor Yue Pei Hu from Alco and also our professor and TAs, Yoga and Bowling and Trenton, they give a lot of help in our project. Finally, do you have any questions? Uh, this is Yue Pei from Alcom. I uh, have a question. What is the most difficult part, do you think, you know, during this project? Uh, actually, it's... Uh, I think the most difficult. Uh, <laughs> the most difficult part is to do the uh, block uh, blocking object detection because we are trying to use the uh, the Raspberry Pi before and it's not uh, respond. Uh, it's not reliable for that processor to run such a uh, big streaming uh, processing. So we change to the CUDA uh, and that works pretty well because we get a uh, thirty pixel per second uh, from the through that is pretty reliable. Thank you, great work guys. Mm, thank you. Hi guys, um, if you guys had more time, what would you like to work on or expand on this project? Okay. Maybe try another algorithm that works on Raspberry Pi uh, because the JSON is much more expensive. Uh, actually, we have a small awkward thing that other 3D print model cannot resist very, very high temperature, but the motor will generate a very high temperature. Uh, we may, uh, it sometimes cause the, cause the model to Deformation. Uh, we want to use some metal as our uh, model, as our handle, as our mount, like that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, looks like no other questions. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks guys. Let's go to the next presentation, Tara. So um, here is our logo, our old logo that you might remember from last quarter. Um, we were called Taro, but um, due to the fact that our drone is now a rover, we have changed our name and we've rebranded to Terra um, with the root Terra meaning ground. And here's our team. So Peter worked on a lot of the software. Um, Swetha worked on the Jetson, the LiDAR, and the mapping. Cher worked on the drone, the rover, and our custom hardware. Jackie worked with the controller interface. And I also worked on the LiDAR and the mapping and drew the logos. All right, let's talk about the problem at hand that our Capstone project tries to answer. Uh, so traditional obstacle avoidance can start getting expensive, right? And also each of the methods of obstacle avoidance that are out there right now have their own set of constraints and problems. Uh, starting with LiDAR, 
Uh, ladder can be relatively expensive and also things like spinning ladder require uh, some sort of component that moves and you might not want that in your system. Also ladder requires line of sight. Uh, another example of an obstacle avoidance method today is using kind of flight sensors and these can be really, really accurate sensors, except they can be very expensive. And also, time of flight sensors have a much narrower field of view. Uh, and last but not least, you can use cameras. Um, cameras can provide really good depth performance and obstacle detection, uh, except they require really uh, good visibility conditions, right? So anything like poor lighting or anything obscuring the lens, like dust and smoke, might be a problem um, if you rely on cameras for obstacle avoidance. And so at the heart of our project is this question, can millimeter wave radar sensors fill this gap that these other obstacle avoidance methods uh, have? And uh, by the end of this presentation, we should convince you that yes, and uh, specifically using uh, the TI millimeter wave radar sensor that came out just as we were starting this project. So it's a really new piece of technology. Not a lot, work, not a lot of work has been done, done on it before, um, except what's ideal about this piece of technology is that per unit cost of the chip itself, $20. So it's new and exciting to work on this piece of technology. Um, and also it's much more cost affordable than traditional methods. So, so what really is millimeter wave radar? Thank you for the introduction, Jackie. Um, so there's these tiny little chips that operate within roughly the 5G bandwidth, if you're familiar with those cell phones. Um, and what they provide is uh, the sensor that we're using it operates with a 130 degree field of view wide, as well as uh, 130 degrees in height. Uh, and they give you back this 3D point cloud, basically points in space uh, with X, Y, and Z coordinates relative to the sensor itself. Um, and it also gives you this Doppler shift data, essentially velocity measurements that are relative to where the sensor is and to where the object that point is. And what's really cool, the really exciting property about this, this sensor is the range is between centimeter level accuracy at around 10 meters and it can detect objects up to 100 meters away with a little bit uh, less accuracy. It can also see through smoke, it can see through dust, it can see through rain. Um, and so this really exciting property also gets us to our next point, which is that we can also see through fabric, it can also see through, through drywall, it can also see through unmoving objects. Um, and if you're trying to do collision avoidance, uh, having a sensor that sees through drywall is a, is a little bit of a problem, uh, a, bit, a bit of an issue if you were trying to not hit a wall. Um, so that it is also incredibly noisy because of that. Um, there's a lot of filtering that needs to happen and this can reduce the accuracy of your points. It, it's extremely sensitive to parameter shifts. Um, these sensors emit frequencies, uh, which then get returned, similar to traditional radar, if you ever imagine that. Um, and depending on how that's set up, you get completely different data results. Uh, so it requires a lot of fine tuning and analysis of the problem. So with that, we really have these, these set of goals with our project. So first off is to demonstrate clear obstacle detection with these sensors working through these noisy errors, um, developing safe control algorithms that will also remain safe, even if your connection to the vehicle is uncertain, laggy, um, or drops packets. And then we also want to demonstrate how radar can be used completely seamlessly with any other sensors that you have to improve, to improve safety. So it can be built in by any engineering group, just throw it on. All right, so uh, with constraints, we had a few constraints. Um, the first one was that uh, with the placement of sensors, we wanted to cover a large field of view as possible, so minimizing dead zones. And in the end, how we did that was that we used three radar sensors, so two on either side and one in the front. And this allowed us to cover 86% of the system. And then with latency, our initial proposal from AV had us working through latency. And so we allowed a minimal amount of latency into the system by using Wi-Fi for control. So instead of doing computations on the system itself, we send messages to the vehicle. And then we also um, operate the radar sensors at 10 Hertz rather than 20 Hertz. And then our obvious constraint time, given that we only had one year to work on this project. All right, so with all those constraints, uh, we have our final product. This is our child, this is our baby. This is the WaveSafe Rover that um, has three radar sensors on it, one LiDAR sensor. We have two NVIDIA Jetsons. Uh, so there's a lot going on here and I'd love to explain it to you guys in a block diagram. Starting with uh, the joystick. So the joystick is how as us users, we control the Rover itself. Um, and that handheld controller is attached to a laptop program or attached to our laptop over USB. And that laptop is running a Python program that takes in those joystick commands and then properly translates them to ROS commands, ROS being a robot operating system. And the uh, ROS commands are easily uh, accessible by our Pixar controller on board our rover, and those commands are being sent over Wi-Fi. 
Um, and running alongside that controller program is an obstacle avoidance program. Uh, and so what that uh, algorithm does is it takes in the data coming from our three radar sensors um, and determines whether or not there's an obstacle detected and if we need to move, stop, or veer out of the way. Um, and as you can see on board our rover, we have a Jetson TX2 uh, GPS and a Pixel controller. And that Jetson TX2 is processing um, two of our radar sensors, the data coming in from those, as well as the data coming in from a LiDAR sensor on top of our rover. And that's all connected over USB. Um, you might notice that the Jetson TX2 only manages two of our radar sensors, and we have three on this system. And the reason that we couldn't have the Jetson TX2 manage three of our radar sensors uh, is because there was data corruption problems. It simply couldn't handle that much amount of data, and also there was concern for the limited amount of power that it supplied. Hence, we have the Jetson Nano also on our rover, which manages solely one radar, data, our radar sensor and the data coming in from that. Okay, heading into our hardware, um, we were very kindly given a quadcopter from our sponsors, um, but we did run into some problems. First, the motors were placed backwards. So um, on initial takeoff, our rover or our quadcopter would do a couple of flips. Um, and then once we placed the motors back into their right spots, we had uh, difficulty landing and flying it. And there were some drifting problems. And because of all these inconsistent flights, um, we had a lot of lost hardware. The uh, quadcopter was very, um, it was very good in the sense that it had all the parts that we needed, like a Jetson TX2 and the PX4. Um, so our algorithm works on a drone, but as of right now, it's on the rover. Okay, and then our rover is from Aeon Robotics. It has the robot operating system, also known as ROS. Um, running on the Jetson TX2. And as Jackie has mentioned before, it also has the PixHawk 2.1 and GPS. And then we also have a tablet controller as a fail safe. All right, and then as for the Jetsons, um, we have the Jetson TX2 on the rover and it was also on the drone, um, but we bought Jetson Nanos for testing um, because they're low cost and they were compatible with the sensors we were using. Um, and we mostly wanted um, USB ports and ethernet ports um, and also high speed computing for um, all the point cloud data that we were uh, processing in real time. And Peter went into depth about this millimeter wave radar, um, but we have three of them mounted onto our rover. And um, the LiDAR uh, is uh, the Slamtech RP LiDAR A1. It's about the size of my palm. It's a spinning LiDAR that's on a motor. Um, and um, it has a two to 10 Hertz sample rate. Um, and right now it's configured to 5.5 Hertz, but here are like the uh, appealing specs, um, but it was um, more expensive than the radars. This one was about 115 in comparison to the $20 radar chip. So software wise, we have a, a whole set of um, Python programs to manage things. Um, so first off, we have uh, Python processes, which manage our, our radar sensors. So we have one that's running on one of the Jetsons and one on the other. Um, and this data is merged when available. And if not, uh, just immediately sent to our obstacle avoidance algorithm. Uh, we also have custom data filtering. So earlier I mentioned how noisy those radars were. We took a really long time to introspect this data, analyze it in a ton of different ways. We did some machine learning. We, we really tried a bunch of different things. What we ended up with was a set of filtering algorithms, uh, which allowed us to remove most of the noise on these sensors before processing them for obstacle avoidance. So this data is something that we're confident in. OK, so the LiDAR, we use the LiDAR to perform SLAM, which stands for Simultaneous Localization and Mapping. And um, it's basically running on ROS, so which is already mentioned, um, Robot Operating System. And we use two packages. So the first one is RP LiDAR. And what it allows us to do is create like a 2D map of the current surroundings, which is what's on the left, the image in the red outline. And uh, the second package is called Hector SLAM. So that allows us to create a continuous map. So as the vehicle is in motion, it's able to constantly update the environment and keep um, updating the pose and stuff. And so it's, it does that through two techniques. So the first one is scan matching and scan matching is where it compares the last scan with the current scan and it finds the minimum error between the scan and the map. And it does this using the Gauss-Newton method. And the second one is pose estimates. So using the really fast update rate of the LIDAR, it uses consecutive scans to determine where the drone is relative to the map and relative to its previous position. So Hector Slam is really neat compared to other Slam techniques because it doesn't need loop closure 
or the need for odometry, and it's able to determine the robot's position and proximity to its surroundings without any of this other stuff. Okay, and then with the uh, what we did in the end is that we interface the lidar with the ROS node, and we use its point cloud data, point cloud data with the point cloud data from the radar radar sensor. And what we found was that um, uh, oh uh, sorry. Um, our initial proposal from AV wanted us to compare the performance with and without LIDAR. And what it allowed us to see was that the LIDAR sensor um, really just allows us to see behind the vehicle. And it doesn't um, really, the algorithm doesn't need it because the radar sensor is so powerful on its own and it really just catches the dead zones as expected. All right, and then finally, we have uh, optical awards algorithms on this project and they're custom, we made them ourselves. Um, and they're relatively simple, but to break them down, um, once an obstacle comes in within a certain boundary of each of our radar sensors, um, either a wall, a rock, a dinosaur, you choose, um, that obstacle uh, can come from multiple directions. So if it's coming head on, our algorithm actually slows down the vehicle at a gradual weight or rate um, such that there's not an abrupt stop. And also with that gradual um, slowing down of our vehicle, we allow some room for latency um, between when the obstacle is actually detected and when we stop our rover. Um, and then if the obstacle is coming in from an angle, we actually introduce veering. Uh, so we take that angle of approach from the obstacle and we compute the tangent um, to that. And that's the path that we have our rover follow in order to not hit the obstacle. Uh, and all of that is done iteratively. So we have a, a demonstration of this, uh, this project. Um, so what this demonstration is going to show is uh, we're essentially going to be, this is on the rover right now, this point of view. We have the camera attached to it, and it's currently doing obstacle detection on the street. Um, we drove it from our apartment um, all the way down through, uh, through the street, actually, and some cars you're about to see, um, safely avoiding these obstacles, and then into Manzanita Village. Um, and we did some more testing there that we'll show here. Uh, so this first test in, it basically demonstrates uh, obstacle slowdown. So we're approaching this obstacle and we're slowing down uh, to not hit this obstacle. And we also implement obstacle veering. So that turn right there was completely automatic um, if you're able to catch that. When we're turning away from these obstacles, we try to find the angle that we're approaching it at and automatically turn and get out of the way of these obstacles. So this was a really interesting feature to implement with these, with these point clouds and we're able to do so pretty quickly. Um, the video might be a little bit laggy. I'm, I'm definitely hitting some performance issues, but it's pretty, uh, I hope it's clear at least, um, that we're able to successfully get out of the way of obstacles as we're approaching them. Um, our system can detect them. We're currently moving at about uh, half to one meter per second. Um, and then we're able to automatically avoid them before we, before we hit them uh, and veer out of the way. Um, so this is complete safety, and this is without LiDAR data. Um, so while we did do some tests, as uh, Swetha mentioned, and we found them to be useful, uh, the fact that these sensors that are $20 each are able to outperform um, a $100 plus uh, LiDAR sensor is, is really impressive and indicative of the quality of this uh, technology. Um, so as you can see here, we are able to turn completely automatically out of the way of these obstacles um, and make sure that we don't hit them. Um, again here, uh, same demonstration. Awesome. So on the next slide, um, so this is one half of it. And the other half uh, is our software package. Um, so we were able to deliver this complete obstacle avoidance package in a robot. And on top of that, we spent on this first project, when we got these radar sensors, we immediately wanted to start coding with them. And we found nothing. <laughs> you know, We Googled it, and, and there, was, there was nothing. Um, there wasn't, it, they were so new that even TI didn't have enough stuff online for us to work with. And we basically had to reverse engineer everything that they built. Um, we did. And we built this into a Python package that has a uh, complete asynchronous sensor management, as well as synchronous tool sets. Um, it supports custom radar algorithms, custom inter interactions with other sensors, uh, works with algorithms that are built for radar. So we were able to get our noise estimation, noise uh, removal algorithms, filtering algorithms into there. We were able to get pose estimation, continuous state understanding, um, estimating movements. We can even mock an IMU and do a continuous state estimation with a single radar sensor. 
uh, which is really impressive and we were glad to get working. Um, and we've been able to publish this as a Python package that you can download right now. Um, and so far, we published it about a month ago. We've gotten a few thousand downloads. Uh, we have some collaborators who are working this uh, out of Sydney. Um, and we're really glad to, to see this working. And we'll be publishing this uh, actually at a conference in October as well. Um, so really great to see a uh, really great community reception um, from this tool set. As such, we'd like to really thank the, the Capstone team here. Uh, Yoga was uh, really integral in getting this done, as well as the two TAs providing great insight in their experience. And a huge thank you to Phil and Scott uh, from Air Environment. Um, their insight was really appreciated, and they were able to provide some really great tool sets um, and insights about what the best path forward is on every turn of this project. So thank you to everyone. Um, thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Good job, you guys. This is Kenton. Uh, so uh, you, you looks like you're very proud of um, getting through that uh, radar chip. Uh, how did you go about, um, I heard you say using the words reverse engineer it. Uh, tell me how you went about that, given that uh, TI probably doesn't have a lot of information yet online about it. Yeah, when it was first released, there was, there was next to nothing. Um, there was a, uh, so they had custom drivers um, in addition to a, a cloud estimator uh, web app, which integrated with their code. Um, so we had to introspect their drivers, um, break down what was going on there, and then break down their web application, uh, which also was based off of some custom code that was pretty hard to find online. Um, so interfacing between the two required us to basically build byte level drivers in Python, um, and then interface with those with their own understanding algorithms of how to decipher that data. So it was pretty involved. Cool. All right. Great job, you guys. Thanks. See, you guys, uh, this is Mark. Uh, you guys mentioned uh, the um, the benefits of uh, radar over lidar, but I was just wondering, um, what are the benefits of lidar over radar? So I know, that, I mean, if, if you could say some of those things as well, I'd like to understand that. Um, I can answer that. Um, so I would say that there's a lot more documentation on LiDAR out there, at least for the radar sensor we were specifically using. Um, also, just LiDAR is more reliable. Uh, as you can see, Peter went through a lot of denoising of the radar chip that we were given. Um, and so if you want something that works right away and isn't difficult to interact with, um, you know, things that have already been used in the past have definitely have a lot more documentation um, and uh, I guess work being done on them. Uh, Cause radar still is kind of a relatively new concept as far as obstacle avoidance. So that's the benefit. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else guys, any other questions? Uh, no, I guess. Okay. So let's go to the, thank you guys. Great job. Uh, next, next presentation. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our final presentation of the NASA sponsored Capstone project. I want to introduce you guys to the team and inspiration to our project name. I guess again. Uh, Rishid, there is a lot of lag. But so. yeah, I'll let you guys to the team and yeah. <laughs> I think we're good, right? Yeah, go ahead. Hello, are we good? Okay, so the team consists of Naimo, who's the team leader, myself, uh, Rashid Aurora as the wireless interface design, Abel Sema, who did the user interface design, Olus Bober, who did model training and procedure design. Edwin, who also did model training and procedure design. Hello. All right. The inspiration to our project name is based off this Greek mythological figure named Panoptes Argus. He is coined by Hera as all seeing due to his abundance of eyes. You can see him on the right. 
It is symbolic of our project because our cameras are all seeing by tracking the procedure of the astronaut that he needs to conduct. It determines whether they're doing it correctly or incorrectly and gives it. And uh, before I go into the solution, we'll go more in depth on this. Uh, thank you, Rashid. Uh, so what is our problem statement? Well, astronauts perform various complicated and assembly procedures that require many steps and many components. This requires them to use various instruction manuals, guides, and often communication with ground control in order for, us to, for assistance. But as we prepare to explore further locations away from Earth, we will experience communication delays and bandwidth limitations. To communicate from Mars, you could experience delays that could take up to 20 minutes, which poses a major issue for future exploration mission. So what do we propose? Our proposed solution is a procedural tracking system that uses computer vision and machine learning tools to track, log, and assist astronauts in completing their tasks. In our procedure, we will be tracking the assembly of the Trojan Robotic X turret kit, as you can see on the right. And one of the reasons we chose this turret kit primarily is because it's similar to the procedures that are performed in the ISS station, which require many different parts and the many different components that need to be connected together. Um, next, I'll pass it over to Abel, who'll talk about the hardware. Thanks, Edwin. So our entire system was running on the NVIDIA Jetson Nano. Uh, the system is composed of a 128 core Maxwell GPU, quad core ARM 857 CPU, and it has four USB ports, which uh, we realized all of them, and uh, one micro USB 2.0 port. And uh, we chose this uh, hardware because of its, uh, its efficient and affordable, and it was good for the computer vision and machine learning applications that we ran on it. And the uh, system was uh, mostly coded in Python, the GUI and the ML applications were coded in Python, and some of it, the camera uh, connection was done in C++. And um, we had two cameras, one connected using the CSI port, and the other one was uh, connected using the Wi-Fi. So here are the two cameras. With the first one is the Raspberry Pi cam. It had an eight megapixel sensor and it captured video at 1080p, which was good for our uh, model detection. And it communicated using CSI port. And then the second camera was the AK, uh, ASO EK7000, which used uh, our TSP protocol to stream and uh, use Python and C++ to communicate with the jets. So this is the workstation. Uh, it was a flat surface, preferably a white background so that we, were easily, uh, we can easily detect the objects. And uh, the two camera options available were the, was the wireless one, which would be on the astronaut's body, and uh, the wired uh, camera, which would be at the workstation, which, which would have the view right here. Uh, and I'll pass it on to Oles, who will be talking about the design. Thanks, Abe. So let's talk a little bit about how the tracking was done in the procedure. So we split the entire procedure into stages at our own discretion. We decided to build the turret from the ground up in the way that we, we thought was the most intuitive and the way that we thought was easy to modularize for users to, um, to assemble. And a lot of the, the detection was done using the Jetson inference package, the NVIDIA Jetson inference package that we found on GitHub. Now we split the object detection into two different models. One of them detected only parts and one of them detected only stages. So on the right in this photo here, you can see we have stage 1.2. It's composed of two parts. The big black plus is called the bottom plate and there's the board on top of it. So if we were detecting using just the part detection model, then there would be two bounding boxes shown on the screen. One that shows the, um, the board and one that shows the bottom plate. But here we have the stage de uh, detection model being active. And the procedure uh, naturally moves on when the user presses a validate button and the um, system checks to see if the current stage is uh, the correct one, and then it will automatically move on to the next one if it is. <clears throat> so uh, a little bit about the object detection training. Um, both of the models were trained uh, also using the NVIDIA Jetson inference package, and we had to create a data set at first. So we started off with around 100 photos of um, each part in each stage from various angles. And uh, some of those photos consisted of augmented uh, photos like, like the previous Sea Shield did. But we found that we didn't have enough photos and we didn't have enough angles uh, of all these parts and stages. So we upped everything to around 500 photos per part and per stage. And as you can see in this top photo here, every single image needed to have a bounding box associated with it. 
and a stage or a, a label associated with it. So we had to manually draw a bounding box around every single photo and manually label every single one. Um, and we originally started training with the, uh, with the Jetson Nano. Uh, it did take around a week, like a whole week to train one model. So we switched to Google Colab Pro for the training process and it ended up taking around 22 to 23 hours per, per model instead of uh, an entire week. So we were also tasked with um, collecting various data during the procedure. Um, we, uh, while the user is performing the procedure, everything is done in the background. And then at the very end of the procedure, when the user completes everything, a, uh, two files are exported, one called stages.csv and one called parts.csv. Stages holds the, um, the stages that were validated correctly by the user, uh, which timestamps for each stage that was validated, as long as the number of missed validations. So for example, if I'm on stage 1.2 and I misvalidate it twice, I get it wrong twice. At the end, there will be a two underneath the missed validations column for stage 1.2. And parts.csv stores every single part that is detected on the, um, on the screen every second, along with their bounding box coordinates and their timestamps. And now uh, Rashid will talk a little bit about the wireless camera interface. Thanks, Tolis. So our interface the EK be on the astronaut's body, as Abel mentioned before. Um, the system can track the procedure while the astronaut can use both hands for the procedure itself. We connect the camera using uh, normal Wi-Fi, which is like connecting to your internet routers or through your laptops or phones. Um, each castle camera has their own unique IP address that we pass into. We manipulate this camera stream to determine whether the astronaut or user is doing the procedure correctly or incorrectly. I will be passing on to Naimo, who will be discussing about software flow. All right, uh, just to reiterate, the purpose uh, for Project Argus is to automate procedure validation. In order to accomplish this goal, we utilize the software flow diagram shown on the right. At the very beginning, we get our procedures from an instructions.csv file, which our custom stage detection model and our custom part detection model utilizes in determining whether or not a user was able to properly uh, validate a specific step. At the same time, we're capturing frames from our Acaso EK7000 Wi-Fi camera. Uh, when a user is working on a specific step, these frames are fed to our custom part detection model. Our custom part detection model spits out a frame with bounding boxes indicating the different parts that are located in that specific frame. This is useful because it gives the user an idea of their workspace and where all the parts are located and what they need in order to complete that specific step. When the user is ready to validate, our Costco EK7000 sends frames and redirects it to our custom stage detection model which also outputs validation data with bounding boxes. This information is also displayed on our monitor. In addition, our validation data is sent to a completion block. Depending on if the user is able to successfully complete a specific step, they're able to move on to the next step and continue to capture frames. If, this, if the step was not completed properly and the program was not able to successfully validate, we stay on the same step and continue to receive frames. And when the process as a whole is complete, we terminate the session. When you start up Project Argus, you're welcome to our login screen. Our entire uh, user interface is designed using Kivi MD. In our login screen, users need to be enrolled in the system in order to gain access to the list of procedures and to be able to actually use the software. Uh, there's two methods of authenticating users onto the system. The first method is a traditional email password system. In addition, we have a facial detection system, which allows users to log in using their face if they're enrolled in the system. If the user was successful in authenticating it to the system, they'll arrive to our main menu page. Our main menu page will list uh, the different procedures that is supported by Project Argus. Currently, since we worked on the Phantom X Robot Turret that's the only procedure that is currently supported on it. When the user clicks on the Phantom X Robot Turret Kit procedure, a list of instructions shows up, giving the user an idea of what specific steps they'll need to do in this procedure. 
When the user clicks on begin, this will give them access to our procedure screen, which Edwin will talk about next. Thank you, Naimo. So this would be the primary point of contact that the user will be interacting with. This will be the primary uh, screen uh, displaying all the assembly instructions. On the top left, you'll see the camera feed. This is where you'll be seeing all the detection happen as well as the bounding boxes. On the top right, you will also see a series of buttons that will be used for the user. The return to main menu button allows you to go back to the menu and allows you to select a new procedure to perform. The previous validate and forward buttons are used to navigate via the assembly uh, as, as uh, previous and forward buttons are used to move back and forth on the assembly. And the validate button will be used in order to detect whether the, the sub-assembly step was done correctly. In order to uh, help the user, we have a show stage preview button, which will be used to demonstrate what that assembly instruction should look like. The bottom right here uh, is a text box that shows all the user interactions on top of the uh, stage, the assembly instruction, and the parts required for that uh, specific step. And we have a little checklist on the bottom middle there. It shows the current step they are in, as well as the steps needed. <clears throat> and, and as you proceed through, it also show the steps that have been completed. Next, I'll pass it over to Abel. Yeah, we want to send a huge thank you to Dr. Yoga, John, Melody, Boning, and Trenton for all the help and uh, advice you gave us this year. We wouldn't have been able to complete this project without that. And uh, we want to show you the demo. If you can, if you can that. Oh, an additional acknowledgement for the UCSB Computer Engineering Department. Hello everyone, welcome to Project Argus. This is going to be a short presentation demo where we will highlight many of the features that we have implemented and a few of the stage transitions. If you are interested in seeing the entire procedure from start to finish, you can find a demo on our website. This right here is our login screen. Edwin is going to type in his information and log in. If a user does not have any login information, they can create an account using the button. Edwin right here is going to create an account for Nymal, and then he's going to be able to log in using the new information. Finally, the user can log in using facial detection. Edwin is one of the users who has been granted access to this program. He can log in by showing his face to the camera. After logging in, the user is presented with the main menu. Here, there is a list of procedures that the user can select. However, we have only added one, the assembly of the Phantom X robot turret kit. When the procedure is clicked, the user is presented with the list of the instructions that that procedure involves. When the user is ready, they can press begin. After pressing begin, we are presented with the procedure screen. In the top left, we have a live feed of our wireless camera. Currently, you can see the Jetson on the screen. In the top right, we have various buttons. Return to main menu returns the user to the list of procedures. Previous sends the user back one instruction in the procedure. Validate checks to see if the assembled stage is on the screen. If it is, it moves on to the next step, otherwise it stays on the current step. Forward sends the user forward one instruction. Show stage preview shows a preview of what the assembled stage is supposed to look like. This feature will be shown later. In the bottom left, we have a text output. It gives the user various information about their current place in the procedure. In the bottom middle, we have a checklist. This gives the user an idea of where they are in the procedure. Here is an example of the show stage preview button being clicked for stage 1.2. Let's now show you how our object detection model actually detects if the user correctly did the step. On our workstation, Edwin has stages 1.2 and 4.3. We are going to purposely misvalidate a few times and we will then validate each stage correctly. First, let's try to validate stage 1.2 with the incorrect stage. As seen in our text output, the validation was unsuccessful. Let's validate it correctly now. So now we have correctly validated stage 1.2, and the procedure automatically moved on to stage 2.1. Now let's use the forward button to move to stage 4.3. We will misvalidate it and then correctly validate it as well. We've misvalidated 4.3, let's now validate it. Okay, so we've now misvalidated and correctly validated both stages 1.2 and 4.3. Let's now end the procedure, back out of the program, and see the data that was collected during the entire procedure. 
This is stages.csv. It shows when a stage was validated and how many times it was misvalidated. This is parts.csv. It shows us which parts were detected every second, as well as their respective coordinates and timestamps. Finally, let's show a clip of the turret moving. That's all for our demo, and thank you very much for watching. Alrighty, anyone have any questions? Thanks, John. Hi, this is uh, Jessica Marquez. I just, uh, from NASA Ames. Um, I just wanted to um, congratulate you guys. This is a pretty exciting demo. Um, and um, I really appreciate all the work that you uh, put into um, this project. Um, so my question was, um, how, or could you speculate or, or extend this to try to adapt um, if someone would be following a procedure but but sort of got around doing uh, the task. So I didn't explain that very well. So like for instance, like if you were asked to replace uh, a piece of hardware, but it's, but you managed to do that, but you sort of went around the procedure to do that. Um, would your method still be um, adaptable or does it have to follow the sequence? So like, for instance, if like, I mean, let me rephrase it one more time. <laughs> uh, so say for instance, like you wanted to get to step four, um, but then you managed to go um, to step four by skipping step three. Um, does your algorithm have to follow step one, two, three, and four? Um, so the, the previous and forward buttons, they're only there for debugging purposes, like right now. Uh, we encountered some issues with, uh, with like how accurate the models were in some of the stages because of just how uh, similar some of the parts looked or how small they were. But um, it like in practice, there shouldn't be a um, forward or, or backwards button unless the user, unless the model like isn't perfect enough you know obviously there's going to be some there's going to be some situations where the user knows that they've done the stage correctly and that's why the stage preview button is there is for the user to override it um but in in essence like at the very end there's the stages.csv is outputted uh it only shows the stages that were actually validated so like if you press forward or back it doesn't actually show that you finished that stage it just assumes you 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 think you did right so okay. I guess if we wanted to uh, make sure that the user doesn't skip stages, we could check at the very end of the procedure if all the stages appear in the stages.csv file, right? We could check if every single one was actually validated rather than just skipped over. Okay. And then yeah. my other question was, um, I understood that uh, you use machine learning to learn the, uh, the, the object that um, that you guys were trying to do a procedure, the turret, right? Would the task have been easier if you had had like a physical like CAD model of the of the of the hardware, like of the turret? Like would that have made your um, identification of the of the um, parts easier? <clears throat> uh, I think I think it would have. I actually remember John yes. once I've asked him. <clears throat> If um, if we yeah, did, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we we originally wanted to add like another button to add procedures, and our only like extra procedures in the main menu, and the only option we had for that was to make a CAD model for every single one. But that that's that's just an extra step that we would like to take in in the in the yeah. future, right? Ultimately, we do think that uh, having a 3D model uh, and training it off of it, as opposed to using images, would definitely improve the accuracy of the model. Great. Yeah, I just wanted to understand that 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 mm -hmm. that basically you guys used images of the hardware to create right. the model. Um, so that's 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 an interesting approach, especially for like um, in 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 space, because 
we might have the, we'll probably have the models of those systems, but they're really hard to get and share. Um, and so the fact that you chose a different method to basically model the hardware, um, you know, I thought that was good. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is John, also over at NASA Ames. Just wanted to say, uh, bravo, everyone. It's been great watching this come along the past many months. <laughs> and it's a very cool word in the book. So thank you. And I look forward to going back and watching all these other demos as well. Oh, yeah, they're pretty long. Nine minutes. Yeah. So you can enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Um, Yes, okay, so that's exactly what we were talking about. Uh, yeah, a 3D model would definitely make mm -hmm. uh, make the process a lot more streamlined and easier, especially from a user standpoint, because right now, if a user wants to add their own procedure, they have to take 4,700 photos and draw bounty boxes around every single one, which is obviously not feasible. This is Melody. I'll congratulate everybody on a great presentation and on a great demo. It's been really exciting to see how the project has evolved since uh, first meeting you guys. Um, my question is, are there any features or elements that if given more time you would have liked to develop further or if there were to be a 2.0 of this, of this prototype, what would that, in your opinion, be the most promising uh, direction for that? I believe one of the uh, things we would try to, we would have liked to implement would be an interactive voice response system. Uh, so just to make it completely hands-free. We, we did attempt to uh, integrate it and thread it into our Justin Nano, but it proved to be, um, to just completely slow down the system to a crawl. Um, so ideally we would like to use additional hardware um, to process that um, additional feature. I, I also want to add on that um, that uh, we we had like a very serious hardware limitation, not a hardware, but a training limitation on Google Colab Pro because I mean, like like I said earlier, it took a, a whole week to train some of the models, and we switched to Google Colab Pro, and then it would take twenty two to twenty three hours, and the the time limit on Google Colab Pro is twenty four hours, so we literally could not make our models better, so. Uh, that's that's the best we could do. So I I would really have liked to be able to you know be able to detect things at a at a smaller smaller parts and at a higher accuracy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I also add on to something? I felt like a good feature that we should we could try to add in the future is more troubleshooting information because currently when we validate a procedure, we just tell the user whether or not they were able to successfully validate that specific step, but there's no information as to if a person was not able to validate that specific step, what kind of steps could they take so that the next time they validate it, it would, uh, they would have a better idea of what they need to do to fix it. Great answers, thank you. Uh, any other questions, anyone? Okay, I think that's it. Th thanks guys, great job. Thank you. Uh, last project for today, Parking base, Luyo, go ahead. Um, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us for this presentation, for the last presentation of today. Um, we are the parking base group, and we would like to present to you our smart parking lot project today. Um, before we get into the details though, let's watch a quick overview video of our project.
This is our gateway for the parking base. It's a Raspberry Pi version 4 with an RFM95 module and an LCD screen. I currently have a separate RFM95 that is transmitting the status of a parking spot every 20 seconds and it will show up on the LCD screen as we can see just there. And it will display which parking spot and uh, whether or not it is full or empty and then it will also transmit this information to the back end. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed the quick demo. Now that we've seen at a very high level how the project works, um, let's dive into the details. Um, I'd like to start by introducing the team behind the Parking Base group. Um, I am Andrew Liu, and I worked on the gateway connections and the web application front end and back end. Hello, uh, my name is Liu Yao. I worked on the sensor firmware, PCB design, and the wireless charging. Hello, I'm Ben Linderman. I work on wireless communication and also the gateway hardware and software. Hello, I'm June. I, I worked on LoRa communication research as well as de developing the virtual demonstration environment. Uh, to give a brief overview of the project, our goal was to design a smart parking lot that directs drivers to the nearest open parking space efficiently and accurately. To do this, we will use small inexpensive parking sensors equipped with a long distance and low power transmission radio, as well as a modern open source and cloud-based software solution paired with an easy to use mobile companion application. So here's a high level system overview. As we can see in the bottom left corner, we have a parking base sensor unit. Each parking space will have its own parking sensor unit, which will communicate with the gateway. The gateway will then use an HTT post command to uh, post to the backend database. And the mobile user interface will then uh, query this backend in order to uh, display the status of the parking lot. Um, the hardware design involved this project mostly on the sensor unit, so I would like to introduce some of the details involved. What is a sensor unit? The very first piece to the solution is to imagine the application scene. So what we have proposed will eventually be realized by installing pieces of hardware on each parking spot. We refer to this piece of hardware, the parking bed sensor unit. Here's what uh, we aim for for the sensor unit. First, we should, uh, it should immediately detect arrival or departure of a vehicle when it just moved in or backed up from the parking space. Second, because uh, each parking space is installed with such units, the unit should have long battery life and a charging mechanism so that the maintenance will be easy. Third, it should have long range wireless capability so that the parking spot uh, availability can be accessed and um, uh, it can be collected, send it to the, um, to the, to the back end. This is a higher level idea. Let me discuss in more detail how we implement each one of these. First of all, for the immediate detection of the parking status, there are two sensors in the, uh, in the sensor unit, the magnetic sensor and the time of flight sensor. Here's how they work. 
We all know that the Earth has a magnetic field. The field strength can be picked up by an ultra-sensitive uh, magnetic sensor called magnetometer. The magnetic field strength will be changed when a piece of metal, um, like the car engine, when it approaches. No matter how slow the vehicle is moving, we learn through experiment that this motion can be detected. Here, for example, say the car is about to move into the parking spot, the engine and the body metal will interact with the field strength reading. Here's a graphical reading of the magnetic field it picked up. The x-axis in this graph is time, y-axis is the field strength fluctuation. If we look into those trends, uh, at the beginning there is a horizontal trend. We recognize this as the Earth's magnetic field when there's no car presence. And then there's, as the car moves into the spot and slows down, there is, is the, uh, the, the car, the, the detection zone that appears in form of a valley. Afterwards, uh, as the car slows down and stops at the parking spot, the reading goes back to the horizontal trend. Um, you might already found out that the problem is that the existence of this amount of noises because the sensor is um, super sensitive, um, they have made it difficult for the microcontroller to say compare with a single threshold value. So in real time, the firmware takes care of these noises by applying the averaging filter of the neighboring values. The waveform is now much smoother. The smooth horizontal trend is the earth field and um, the region below the average or away from the threshold is um, the vehicle detection zone. So you might also wonder when the car's backing up, it's still going to be this uh, similar waveform, but in reverse. The time of flight sensor works by an extremely straightforward mechanism. It detects by monitoring a shorter vertical distance between uh, the ground and the car. The second requirement for long battery life, we have selected parts that are uh, low power consumption, generally order magnitude of uh, microamps at, at active states. The unit is able to run around three years into the battery dies. And when it dies, internal circuit, um, the, the internal wireless power receiver we have integrated allows wireless charging capability from off the market wireless charger uh, compatible with WPC standards. This is really popular with uh, already on the market Apple, Android phone wireless chargers. Now, before going to the third point, long-range wireless capability, I think you might start to wonder um, what's actually in the hardware. So let's take a look at these. On the right, you see the electronic parts assembly in the decomposed view. We designed two PCB boards that handles the part management and the vehicle detection separately, and they connect peripherals uh, through bus connectors and pin headers. The battery provides power. The wireless coil and the, the battery charging IC charge the battery. On the right, the magnetometer and the, the time of flight sensor, of course, sen uh, detect the vehicle. And then the LoRa, essentially, it's a, a, a wireless transceiver communicates with the back end. The boards are designed in KiCad. These are four layer boards. We convert design to manufacturing files and send it to our PCB sponsor, Laratech, and have them manufactured. After receiving the manufactured boards, we have manually sorted the microcontrollers and the sensors onto PCBs and tested with waveform. And we 3D printed the case so that these electronic components can be showed inside of the case. So here's a decomposition view of the entire assembly. Uh, right now, I'm actually holding one. Uh, uh, it's a complete assembly of the entire sensor unit. But uh, for a fact, it's very hard to review what's inside of it. So we made this nice decomposition, decomposition view of the entire assembly. On the slide, you're able to find electron, electronic components in the previous slide encased in it. It is designed so that the unit is attached to the ground uh, with several major bolts. Yes, we have successfully pulled everything together in previous three quarters that involved uh, the sensor uh, testing, PCB layout, component-wise assembly function verification, the firm integration, and the final assembly. Uh, what we're most, what we're are, uh, most proud of is that uh, it's cost. Uh, by prototyping, uh, this thing costs around 40 bucks. And um, if we imagine this thing goes into massive um, uh, production, it is very likely that we find uh, alternative components that basically achieve the same function with lower money. Uh, my best estimate is around uh, 30 bucks um, per um, parking spot. And this is a very competitive price uh, compared to uh, what's already existed out there in the market. So if you're thinking about scalability, I think this is a very good option. Um, because of time reasons, um, I want to give you a general idea about scalability, but I need to move on to the next section. Um, so right now, uh, how, does, uh, how does these internal components uh, function together? I will talk about uh, what the firmware routine is. Um, the, peripheral, the sensor peripherals first picks up the vehicle status. Uh, the microcontroller receives these status through communication bus and um, on, the, on the time interrupt. And then the microcontroller posts this to the backend gateway through long range wireless communication modules. This leads to the detail of the third requirement, the, the long range wireless capability is known as LoRa. Let's invite June to talk about the wireless communication protocol we use in this project. 
For picking the wireless communication method, we needed something with a wide range and low power consumption, preferably highly scalable so that we would only need one or a few gateways. After some research and live testing, we decided that LoRa was the way to go. Uh, the first benefit of LoRa is its long range, which spans two kilometers to several hundred kilometers in the right conditions. As you can see on the figure on the left, this is significantly larger than most other common forms of wireless communication. And in our live testing, that we found that we were able to transmit a distance of 250 meters across five floors of two adjacent parking structures. This could likely go even further beyond, but we stopped there as it was already more than enough. Uh, the second major reason for choosing LoRa was its low power consumption. LoRa has a similar active power usage as other low power communication protocols such as Zigbee and Bluetooth low energy, while also having the benefit of massive range. To accomplish this, data is transmitted using a lower frequency range, which means that the data transfer rate is slower. However, this is not a major issue in our case as the packets we are sending aren't very large. On the other hand, this also means that the system is more resilient to noise from common signals such as Wi-Fi. There is also no innate limit on the number of supported devices, which means that depending on the size and frequency of packets being sent, each channel of the gateway can support several hundreds of devices. We will, oops. So a little bit off. we will now discuss the gateway. Uh, the gateway was designed using a Raspberry Pi version four, along with an LCD screen and an RFM95 module. The LS LCD screen was mainly used for debugging purposes, but also displays the status and uh, when a new packet is received from an end node. Uh, we programmed this using the RFM9X library and is connected to a MongoDB on the back end. Uh, the gateway is responsible for receiving and transmitting three bits of information. The first being the parking space or the, uh, where the parking space is located, the status of the parking space, and a timestamp at which this status was received. As Louis Al mentioned, one of the uh, greatest things that we need to do is we need to address scalability. So in order to do that, uh, I will go over the data flow uh, from an endnode to the back end. So as we can see to the left here, we have an endnode, which is called LoRa001. And this uh, endnode is transmitting at 915 megahertz. Uh, the gateway is receiving at 915 megahertz and the end node tries to transmit to the gateway. However, it never receives an act back. So it, uh, within a set time frame later, it will then try and transmit again. Upon receival of an act, uh, the parking base end node will then stop transmitting. Um, and this gateway will then transmit that information through an HTT post to a backend database, a MongoDB. Um, this information is really useful because Imagine we have a parking lot with 500 uh, end nodes. This can become very complicated and there can be a lot of collisions upon transmission. However, the good thing about this library RFM9X is that we can actually program the gateway to receive on different channels. So we can put 100 end nodes on one channel and then another 100 on a different channel. And this makes for easy scalability and uh, it's very straightforward. So this gateway is easily scalable and also uh, great at dealing with collisions and uh, transceiving and Um, so now that we've uh, discussed how the sensor units function, uh, as well as how the gateways collect sensor data and store it in the database, um, let's see how users can actually interact with this data. Um, here we have our mobile interface that you saw earlier. Our goal with the user interface is to allow users to find an open parking space and get to it in the shortest amount of time. Um, right when you open the app, you can see the status of all the parking spaces within the parking structure. It lets you know where all the open spots are. However, if we were to stop there, that wouldn't really help solve the problem since if everyone was looking at the same open spot, um, only one person can ultimately get to it. So drivers who don't end up getting the spot would still be dr uh, stuck driving around, uh, losing time. Therefore, we have implemented a feature where the user can tap one button to find and reserve an open spot. Um, when this happens, the app will find the closest parking spot to the lot's pedestrian exit and then reserve it for five minutes to give the driver enough time to navigate to it. Um, and then we'll direct the user to that space using an arrow on the map. Once you've parked, um, the app will remember where you parked. So when you're ready to leave, all you need to do is simply launch the app again and you're immediately presented with the same parking space that you are currently parked in. 
Uh, lastly, since this app was originally designed for UCSB's parking structures, um, we were able to integrate it into our school systems using UCSB NetID login. And the same could be done for external parking structures as well. Um, we also have a section of the user interface for parking lot owners and administrators as well. Um, using the admin user interface, parking lot owners can view the status of all the parking spots within the parking lots. Additionally, we make it easy for parking lot owners to deploy new parking lot sensors, as you can add and remove sensors into your parking lot with one click on the map. Um, and this interface is usable on any web browser, so it's compatible with most devices that parking lot owners have today. Um, now that we know how the user interface works, let's discuss the software frameworks and technologies that went into making this app. Um, we wanted this app to be easily accessible on as many devices as possible, and the majority of phones that drivers have today are iOS and Android. Um, however, we didn't want to deal with maintaining two separate native code bases, so we decided to instead make a progressive web application, or PWA for short. It's a web application, but it's designed to look like a native application, and it works well on both platforms. Because it's a web application, the front end is built using React. Uh, React is a JavaScript framework for building user interfaces using a component-based model. Um, additionally, I use Chalker UI, which is a UI framework with many pre-made user interface elements, um, allowing for a consistent design throughout the application. The back end is built using Next.js, is a, which is a React framework that supports features such as server-side rendering for front end pages, as well as the back end API routes, which has proven useful for building our gateway application. Um, the app is then deployed on Versal, the company that maintains Next.js. Uh, lastly, as Finn mentioned earlier, our application database is built using MongoDB and stored on Atlas. Um, the gateway is able to interact with the MongoDB database using HTTP POST requests. Um, exposed from the Next.js backend. Um, this stack was chosen in, particularly, uh, in particular because of its popularity, scalability, and cost. All of the frameworks that we mentioned here are used by many large companies for their websites, and they are still actively being maintained and are also open sourced. Um, the cloud services we use, Next.js and MongoDB Atlas, are both designed for production traffic. And our initial while our initial demonstrations were done entirely on their free tiers, if we were to deploy this out into the world, we could easily scale up our bandwidth. Um, so that concludes our presentation. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Qualcomm, Laratech, CACI, and the College of Engineering for the support, as well as the teaching staff, um, Professor Sukpali and TAs Boning and Trenton. Um, thanks for listening. We would be happy to take questions now. Hi, this is Kenton. Um, so uh, good job, you guys. Uh, I just This is more of a curiosity question than something that would be a major part of your project. But uh, it was a nice looking package that you printed. Did you drive over it a few times and see how robust it was? <laughs> Uh, by robust, do you mean uh, the consistency, the the consistency of uh, you know, showing the same waveform with the with several vehicles? Is that you're trying to ask? No, no, it's just, more about the uh, physically. Uh, <laughs> did you try it with cars driving over it? Like you yeah. actually get in I a think, structure? Yeah, it's part of the it's part of the demo video. Uh, we kind of. I think yeah. he means like if your like, tire physically runs over the thing. Oh, yeah. so yeah, that, I guess that comes to like the um, you know the strength of the three D printing material. I you know it took it took me some time to to print a case, so we didn't actually try it. But you know you actually put in me interest. I, I I actually want to test it out today sometime. <laughs> All right, thanks, you guys. Yeah. How many, uh, um, this is Mark Alcami. How many of these did you guys build uh, for testing? For um, We, so we have uh, five electronic parts, uh, printed five case. Uh, the one I actually put into tests and like put them together are three because the rest of two are, they aren't that, like the, the 3D print, in the case they kind of messed up but you know we uh tested on uh the three the three of them they functions the same and because we have uh the scalability built in into the back end uh i think it's safe to say the thing is uh, scalable to a large extent yeah great thank you very much uh -huh. great presentation what is the um what range do you guys have so uh between the each of the, the parking spots and also the the gateway 
I discussed this a little earlier. Mm -hmm. The individual parking sensors can uh, transmit up to it, it. You can basically transmit it to any point on the parking lot, like even from end, like to the bottom floor on one corner to the top floor on the other corner. So as long as they're on the same frequency, they should be able to transmit. Okay, and then what's also the, the theoretical maximum you can have on each gateway? Uh, we haven't actually, we, well, we couldn't really test that really, but the, I think- The theoretical, the theoretical uh, LoRa uh, at 955 megahertz, some, I, I remember I look online, it's around 10 kilometers, but in real life application, you have floors and obstacles, it's hard to say. So I, I, theoretical 10 kilometers. I think he meant like the number of devices, right? Yeah, how many devices can you hook up to a single gateway? I so if you've got a single gateway and a, you know, say a four story <laughs> parking garage, would that be able to handle all of those? I believe one gateway should be able to handle about a hundred, but I'm not too certain. Okay. So I guess it's worth mentioning that there, okay, there technically is no like theoretical limit to the number yeah. of de devices you can attach to a gateway. However, the more devices you add and the more devices that are transmitting at the same time, the more likely you are to get collisions. So there ends up being some point where as you add more devices, it actually hurts, you know, your gateway um, and it becomes, you know, harder for mm -hmm. other devices to transmit as well. Um, now, obviously this is a number that we want to, to figure out, but um, we don't have the resources or the uh, physical location yeah. to test it with. Um, but you know, if we were to actually deploy this in a real world scenario, this is something we would definitely test beforehand. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. I think that's it. I don't think there are any more questions. Track, congratulations, track. You guys have won third place. You guys did an amazing job. Parking base, give it up for parking base. Congratulations, guys. Tara, congratulations, Tara. You Good guys thing. did an amazing job. Congratulations for the faculty award. We have Project Argus with NASA. Congratulations, Project Argus.